That was my next question was that this is not necessarily live to tape, like complete 100% playback. No. You're going to do some editing. Good. No. All right. Very good. Thank Yay. you. And I've already re recorded your bio and the intro. So that. Oh, good. So what Great. I'll do just to give us a flow is I'll read the sort of um, basic intro that I do for all of them. Where I okay. introduce you, but I won't read the whole bio. That's done. And I'll go straight good. into the conversation. Perfect. Um, so I'm very excited. So we are going to hop. In. All right, here we go. Three, two, one. Hello, and welcome to At the Podium with me, Patrick Huey. At the Podium is a multimedia platform that brings together people from a diverse background of lives, careers, and experiences who all share one thing in common. They have stepped fully into the transformative power of finding and raising their voices to make an impact on the world we live in today. At the Podium holds a space for everyone to share their stories, to be heard, and to bring us inspiration. Today, I'm thrilled to share the podium with Liz Bruner, an Emmy Award-winning journalist Liz Bruner's television career spanned 28 years and featured many memorable highlights. Along with co-anchoring the number one rated 6 p.m. newscast at ABC TV, WCVB News Center 5 in Boston, she conducted exclusive one-on-one -on -one interviews with prominent figures ranging from professional athletes to global political leaders including President Barack Obama, as well as cultural icons such as Oprah Winfrey. In 2013, Liz excitedly embarked upon her next chapter, becoming the CEO and founder of Bruner Communications and launched BrunerAcademy.com in 2020. Both are dedicated to helping people find their authentic voice, tell their story, and lead with presence. Liz is also the best-selling author of Dare to Own You, taking your authenticity and dreams into your next chapter. As an expert communications coach and motivational speaker, Liz is also the host of the Live Your Best Life with Liz Bruner podcast. Liz guides her guests to share their stories of self-discovery and recreation. A classically trained vocal performer and former high school music educator, Liz holds a Bachelor of Music degree from the Lawrence University Conservatory of Music. She has performed with the Boston Pops and at professional sporting events for teams, including the Boston Celtics, the Boston Red Sox, and the New England Patriots, among others. Before we hear from Liz today, I want to invite you to share at the podium with the people in your lives. If you find our conversation today helpful, and I trust that you will, take a screenshot and share on your Instagram and tag at the podium underscore Patrick Huey. Or if you're on LinkedIn or Facebook, share our links there. Your shares, likes, and five star written reviews help grow our audience and move us up the charts. I'm grateful for your support in this capacity. Okay, Liz, welcome to At The Podium. Oh, Patrick, thank you so much for that lovely introduction. And I'm so happy to be with you today. I remember when we first met and I thought you just had this wonderful energy about you. And now we're having this conversation today. So I'm truly delighted. Thank you for having me. I, I'm so happy that you said yes and that we and that we did meet about, it's been a few months since we met yes. in Boston. And I have to tell you, this for me is one of the most exciting interviews that I've done. And I'll tell you why. You embody two passions of my life, which you you would not know that. <laughs> but the first is you're a classically trained singer. And I have to tell you, my very first acting job in New York was at the Metropolitan Opera <laughs> in 1993. I was hired. You'll love this because you were trained in this. But I was hired to be a sword fighter and dancer in a remount of Otello at the Metropolitan Opera starring Placido Domingo. Oh. Um, yes. <laughs> and, okay, but, uh, I'm, having, I'm having fan envy here. <laughs> well, let me tell you, at one point in the show, 
I w- we were like the sort of secret service around him. Um, there were four of us. And at one point in the show, we have to come up to him and take one cloak off, put one cloak on. And he's singing the whole time we're doing this. So I was probably standing as close to him as I am from my monitor, which is probably a foot and a half away from me right now. And when he would sing, the entire stage would shake. I believe you, that. You would feel the vibration in your feet. Oh, now, he has such other- a powerful voice. Oh, and a real actor. He wasn't just a singer. He was mm. a real, real actor. And and you could, even being so close to him, and sometimes that can be, you know, when you're standing that close to someone singing, there can sometimes be a disconnect between the singing and the whole thing because it's so loud. But completely blended, completely mm. whole in him. The other thing about that production was that Renee Fleming sang Desdemona. Oh, okay, now I'm having double fan envy. Okay. And amazing. I had no idea what was going on. And so <laughs> I had no idea. And so one of those old hands who's been at the Met for years says mm-hmm. to me, if you like what they're doing, go hear Callus. And so I walked, I walked down from 66th Street down Fifth Avenue to about 45th Street to the Sam Goody and went in. And this is back in the day, you'll remember this, when they had like in, in the music stores, they would have the like little listening stations and you could like mm-hmm. go in and pick people. <laughs> We're dating ourselves, but yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And they, they just happened to have Maria Callas in the, in the queue, in the classical oh, section. Mm-hmm. And I fell in love. I fell in love with the opera and I've loved it ever since. And so when I saw that you were a classically trained singer, I was like, wow, this is, this is great. The other thing before you respond was when I was a little boy and I was going off to college, the one thing I wanted to do, and I was very specific, I don't know how I got this specific about it, was I wanted to be a reporter slash anchor. That was the job I wanted to have. And then life took me in a very different direction. I, I was I was going to the University of Texas in Austin to study journalism. I ended up going to Vanderbilt instead. So when I got to Vandy, I realized there was no journalism program. And so I cobbled together my own idea of what a journalism degree was, which was uh, the the writing, the reading and the English in the program, the theater, the directing, acting, and then the sociology to pull it all together to give it some kind of context. So you embody everything that I was very excited about, still am in my life. So I'm very happy to have you on the show today. I think we're kindred spirits in some way. My goodness. <laughs> Thank yes. you. Yes. So oh I, was, I was reading your book, Um, And I'm going to pull up the quotes here because there were two really beautiful quotes in your book, Dare to Own You, which I I love that title because it is a dare to step out on faith. There were two quotes in the book that you you referenced that really moved me. And one was from Anna East Nin. And she says, life shrinks or expands in proportion to one's courage. And then you quoted Jack Canfield, who wrote the intro to your book. And he says, You've either created it, promoted it, or allowed it to be that way. And in their own unique ways, they're essentially saying, I think what's sort of at the heart and core of what you wrote, which is that you have agency in your life. Mm. You have the ability to make the changes you want to make, be the person you want to be at any point in your life. And that those two quotes to me really synthesized to me what the book was about. Thank you very much for saying that, but it's not without trepidation, mind you, (laughs) that I have made these career changes. Because when you think about it, I went from being a high school music teacher to working in retail, chapter number two. Chapter number three was my 28-year television career to chapter number four, which is the one I'm currently in as an entrepreneur and have been in for almost nine years as an executive communications coach. So now you take all of those pieces and it does take courage to step out of, you know, not knowing what you wanted to do and saying, okay, I feel like organically deep within my soul, there's something more I'm supposed to do. So I'm going to leave teaching Hmm. and leave singing, although I still continue to sing semi-professionally, but I'm going to, I'm going to take this leap of faith and figure it out. And I kept trying to figure it out. Every single chapter I had, I took another leap of faith, which takes tremendous courage. And so, you know, not to pat myself on the back, but I do think that that is something that is also, I'm now learning at this age, I have been courageous. Mm -hmm. I have been courageous. And I encourage people, be courageous. 
try not to be afraid. And even when I was leaving television after 28 years and launching my business, when I never, ever wanted to own my own business, okay, let's just start with that. I knew for me, if fear was the only thing standing in my way, Patrick, mm. that was not a good enough reason to not take that leap. And I did. And looking through your life, your journey, you referenced it, you start as a music teacher. You then end up in Tampa at the news station there. And then you take another leap of faith and you end up in Boston where you were on the number one rated show at 6 p.m. for almost 20 years. You were you were the voice and the face of the community of Boston. And having lived in Boston, I know how important that is in that city. And, and to me, I, I really felt in all the stages that you have been in in your career, what you're really doing, and even now as you're in your in your latest iteration as a CEO of your own business, as, as a communication coach, you're creating platforms for people to be heard and to be seen and to be valued. And in, and in the true sense, you've validated thousands of people's existences. And I want to know, was that the intention always? And where did that come from within you to, to have the courage, as you said, to do that? I don't think it was the initial intention to be quite truthful with you. And when I was trying to figure out what my next chapter was going to be, because I really didn't know, I was confidentially talking to people two years. For two years, I was talking to people before I left television to say, what does somebody like me do? When you're thinking, maybe there's something else more. I again was feeling this organic feeling of there's something more I'm supposed to be doing. And for me to be able to step back and kind of figure out three different lanes, I thought, okay, I could be some communications expert at a, at a corporation. I had no idea who. I could maybe get more involved with charities, nonprofit organizations as an executive director, although I'd never done that before either. Or I could launch my business and I could teach people about presence and public speaking and presentation skills and storytelling and leadership and oh yes, media training too. And one of my mentors said to me, Liz, you're well-known, you're well-respected, you have credibility. Mm -hmm. That is value. Why would you give that value to somebody else? Mm. Launch your business. Six months, nine months, you don't like it. You don't have any clients. You can always go do something else. And in a kaleidoscope moment went click for me. And I made the decision that day. And six weeks later, I was, I was gone. I did it. And I launched my business. And I never looked back. And I really didn't know how I was going to do all this. As I said, I never, ever wanted to run my own business. I didn't think I was smart enough to run my own business. But I remember confidentially, confidentially sharing that vulnerability with somebody. And this is what they said to me. He said, Liz, you're smart. You'll figure it out. Mm. It's like, okay. And I've always had a mantra, Patrick, of just because I've never done something doesn't mean I can't. I just have to try. I'm not going to be 100% successful at every single thing I try, but I'm going to try. I'm going to try. And I did. And I learned as I went along as to how I could help people, how I could help them find their voice. A lot of the time through my own experiences, what I think makes a really good teacher, a teacher is also a student. And if you're a teacher, you are also a student. And as long as you continue to be a student, you are learning and growing as mm -hmm. well as teaching. And so for me, finding my own voice and still finding my voice has been a learning process for me, but I'm also helping other people learn how to find their voices through some of my own experiences. There were two really wonderful moments in the book that you talked about in terms of this courageous act of stepping out away from a very successful career into an unknown. One, you talked about having the courage to find those informational interviews with people and the people who you could be vulnerable with and share your experiences with. And then you also talked about going to that I believe it was a, a cocktail party or a mixer or a fundraiser. I, I don't recall the details, but you bought the ticket, you went alone, and you talked about the importance of when you're stepping into something new, yes. that you take those moments to build relationship with people, even if it's, and you talk about it in your work too, that when you would interview, perhaps when you interviewed Barack Obama, that you thought it was really important 
to build a connection with that person first. You want to have the appetizer before the meal and the appetizer is building the connection. And I think both of those things, the informational interviews and the taking the time to build the connections really resonated with, with me within your book and your work that you, that, as you described it. Speaking of that human connection, for example, when I interviewed President Barack Obama, first and foremost, I'm a human being first before I was a reporter. Okay, so I'm, I, I, that human connection was very important to me. Now, mind you, I, I was writing the White House for four years to get that interview, and I finally got it. But it was important to me to connect with him on a human level. And of course, in my own research of him, along with everything else I had to ask him in my very short window of time, what was wonderful was I knew that he had been, he had been born in Hawaii. He was born in Hawaii. And I had grown up in the islands. Wasn't born there, but grew up in the islands. And so when he walked into the room and he greeted me and he said, hello, Liz. And I said, hello, Mr. President, or should I say aloha? <laughs> and so we, and I chatted with him and shared with him that I had grown up in the island. So we had that wonderful little moment of connection. Mm. And then at the end of the interview, I saved a question for the very end, because I was afraid that his team would kick me out the door and I wouldn't have any more time with him. But I asked him, which is harder, being president of the United States or being the father of two teenage girls. Again, mm -hmm. I wanted that human connection that people could connect with themselves and re would resonate with them. So it is about that human connection and it is about relationships. And the event that you were talking about was the Boston Business Journal Power 50 cocktail party. And I had just recently left Channel 5 and I opened up the, the Boston Globe that day. There's this full page ad, actually two full page ads, but all these people that were being honored that night of the Power 50 event. And I'm looking, I go, I know that person. I know this person. I know her. I know him. I, I thought, wait a minute. I have relationships with these people, but they know me as Liz Bruner, news anchor from Channel 5. I am now CEO and founder of Bruner Communications. And I bought my ticket and I went because I felt it was very important to continue to reestablish relationships, but at the same time, I needed to have them begin to see me in a new light. Mm. I want to know where this comes from in you, because not everyone has the capacity or the ambition or the drive to make these huge leaps that you've made, <laughs> to take the, the time to figure out how do I go from A to B? And I know, I know you, your father was a, a minister, a pastor, a reverend. I know you come from a multiracial background, which we'll talk about. You're capturing me on so many levels right now. And I, I think one thing I want to know is how, where within you does this ability come from? Mm. I do have a faith mm. and I think that plays a role. But what was interesting too is I've, I've wondered that myself. Where, where does all this come from? And I talk a little bit about it in the book. There was, there's a chapter, and you'll, and you'll remember from reading this, and thank you, by the way, for reading my book, Dare to Own You. I really appreciate that. And I, I was putting a lot of my family history and heritage in the book. I kept saying to myself, why do I feel so compelled? Why, who's going to care about my family lineage? And I put it down into my computer, and I got up, and I love to walk the Charles River in Boston. And so I got up and I started walking across to the river. And literally, I'm, I'm talking to God. I'm talking to the universe. I'm like, why do I need to do this? Why are you put, making me put this in the book? And tears started streaming down my face because it suddenly dawned on me the weight of this heritage and lineage of doctors and engineers, and I mean, it just, I mean, and, and the history that goes back to when the Apostle Thomas converted 12 families to Christianity in India eons ago to whoever came over on the Mayflower, and, and on my answer says, own the farmland under Boston Common. And so there's this heritage that I didn't even realize I felt the weight of. And then it dawned on me, not that my parents ever put any pressure on me. You have to succeed. You have to do this. You have to go after that. I never felt that. Unconsciously, though, I believe it was there. And I also felt like how many people in the world today have, whether it's conscious or unconscious, feel the weight 
of you're supposed to be a lawyer because I own the firm, I founded the family firm and you need to do this or you need to be a doctor or you need to be do the expectation that is there for a lot of people. And again, I did not feel an expectation consciously. I think I put it on myself unconsciously to continue to strive and drive to be the best I could be at whatever I attempted to do. And it, it's it's woven into us all. There there are even even if the pressure is not overt or the, the wish is not overt, it's, right. it's in the signals that are sent and exactly. where you grow up and where you go to school and and what your parents value as a child that you see them value. It's 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 still present within you. It's all there. It's I mean, I went to this school, you need to go to this school. I mean, it's all there, whether they're they're conscious, unconscious, overt or not, it's all there. I wanted to talk to you about racial identity because it's come up in, in this show several times and you bring it up in your book yourself. You say, I am a melting pot. I am a mosaic. I am an American. And you talk about this in reference to the challenges of identity, not for you, <laughs> but for <laughs> others trying to place you within a specific lane to probably make them feel comfortable because you didn't have an easily discernible ethnic heritage or racial identity for people to sort of latch onto. And I wonder, did that impact your vision of yourself? And can mm. this also have played a part in your success as a teacher and an anchor and now a coach? Because you got a three-dimensional understanding of what empathy means mm. because you went through that experience. Well, first, let me set level set here. I'm not gonna say that the experiences I had are so traumatic and even can compare to what other people experienced in their own lives or continue to experience today when it comes to prejudice. But you're right, people didn't know. Well, is she black? Is she white? Is she Hispanic? What is she? What is she? Does it matter? <laughs> it does to a lot of people, but it didn't matter to me. But I do think that that experience did, I think, contribute to what I'm going to define as being a good student of human nature. And what that gave me, and I think it's what made me a really good reporter and journalist, and it's what makes me a good coach, is that I'm a good student of human nature. I have to assess very quickly, how am I going to connect, back to that part of our conversation, how am I going to connect with this person? How am I going to connect with this person? How am I going to help that person? And when, as a reporter, you have you know, a, a limited amount of time sometimes with someone, and you have to get to the essence and the core of their story very quickly, you have to know how to connect with them. And so being a student of human nature and having all of those experiences that I have gone through, I do think gave me a different lens in knowing how to connect with people. Does that make sense? It, it makes perfect sense. And I think I think it really, it speaks to the, the success you've had throughout your career, that you have that incisive mm -hmm. ability to see a person. It's not about sizing someone up for weakness. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. about sizing up who they are in their humanity to reach- Within their soul. Within, within their soul. Right. Absolutely, absolutely. It, it, it's- it's it's actually quite quite moving. I had a reverse experience when I, you know, I'm obviously African American, though I've done the 23 and Me, and I find there's a lot more going on in me than I ever thought. <laughs> there always is. You're a mosaic too, right? I was like, what do you mean I'm 20% British? <laughs> <laughs> well, I've but, got a little Scottish, a little French, a little German, a little. I mean, I mean, I'm a melting pot. You're a melting. So and it's, you. it's a beautiful. It's a beautiful analogy. But I moved. I left America for five years and lived in the Caribbean and then lived in Asia. And when I did that, I had to have a very different view of myself as a black man because they were looking at me differently. And so all of the pieces and all of the, the walls that I had built up over the years, just growing up in America and being a minority or in a, in a minority group had to fall away. And I had to rediscover myself without those hindrances. It changed me, it changed me as a person. Because I was like, what does my life look like if all the things that I use to, to define and identify myself no longer matter? 
particularly in a place like the Caribbean where most people are, are Black or African ancestry. Mm -hmm. Growing up in Hawaii, you know, we were surrounded by multicultures, you know, African-American, Hawaiian, Filipino, Japanese, Chinese, I mean, you name it. And, you know, there we are, these little brown children and brown because of my mother being from India. My father was American. And, you know, she, she used to tell the story that when we were all on the beach as little children running around, you know, and the tourists, as we call them, the Howleys would come up and say, oh, can we take a picture of your beautiful Hawaiian family? My mom got so tired of saying they don't have an ounce of Hawaiian blood in them, but sure, go ahead. <laughs> it's those kinds of experiences that I know for myself, you know, I didn't, I was colorblind growing up, if you will. And then moving at the age of 10 to Lily White Peak in Illinois in the heart of the Midwest where everybody was white and everybody, the, the KKK was known to exist. It was a huge culture shock. So I can relate to your own culture shock of going, wait a minute, I'm suddenly being looked at differently. How, what, what does this mean? What does this mean? So you, Liz, mentioned Hawaii. And one of my dear friends who I've known for, for many, many, many years was actually Miss uh, Teen USA from Hawaii when we were growing up. And so I've always had, I think, a, a bit of an insider perspective on the pageants from, from having spending so much time talking to her. And I know that you too came up in the Miss America pageant system. You were Miss Illinois. And I wonder if you think or what your perspective is on why pageants have had such challenging reputations in recent years. And it can't just be because of the swimsuit issue. Because I see the women who come out of the pageant system who are incredibly poised, well-spoken, very focused, and many of them are doing that to get money to pay for school. Well, the, the Miss America pageant system is actually a scholarship pageant system. You get a scholarship for your education, which is very different than the Miss USA. Mm. So there, there's the distinction between the two. And that's one of the reasons why I was in that pageant system. I needed money for school. But to answer your question, it's almost like there's a love-hate relationship with pageants. And some people, you know, they, they want to look and they want to look at the, the women. They want to see their talent. And oh, but, you know, that's just too superficial. Well, guess what? I'm not superficial. A lot of the women I knew in the system were not superficial. We're smart, we're educated. We have a lot of thoughts. We have a lot of opinions. We have a voice. And I think sometimes, again, you know, I think it speaks to some of the, the challenges that I had, which were that a lot of women were intimidated by me. And I, I don't know whether more men hate the system the pageant system or more women hate the pageant system. That's a survey for somebody else to do. But I would probably venture to guess that the love hate comes from more women. And whether it's a jealousy, whether it's being intimidated, whether it's thinking that, oh, all those women are just superficial and they're not authentic. I just don't think they understand or have met enough of us, if you will. And it is not always about the swimsuit competition. Look, do I like to take care of myself? Absolutely, yes. And it served me well in an industry where I'm on television every night, okay? You have to take care of yourself. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that. So I'm not sure what the reason is, but I, I, there is a love-hate. I would have to concur. Yeah, and, and you know, and Kelly, her name is Kelly Who, went on to have an amazing career as an actress. I mean, she's been in the X-Men movies. She's wow. been in amazing movies. And she makes no apologies about it. You know, it, it, afford, it's, it was a platform that I think for many of us afforded us an opportunity. I probably didn't take as much advantage of my platform when I had it. Mm -hmm. In hindsight, I guess, you know, people say, well, do you have any regrets? I don't have any regrets, really, other than not changing my name to Chaco when I was on television, which is my mother's maiden name. I would have been Liz Chaco. Had I known what I know today about the business back then, I would have changed it. Right. But, but truly... I don't think I knew enough of how to leverage that platform. And you know what? Today, Patrick, every single one of us is a brand. Our companies are brands, but we are brands too. And we have an opportunity to showcase our brand and who we are in our best authentic self. Mm. And it's important to do so. I think in many ways, people are not ready for that. 
they're that not idea. because you have to own who you are in order to do that. <laughs> you must. And you're right. And, and I, you know, I was speaking to a woman who's a very successful director in Hollywood. She directed almost all the Hannah Montanas. Uh, she directed for Sesame Street. And she talked about her imposter syndrome, which you reference quite often in your book. And you, and you say this, when mm -hmm. you were looking to make that transition into to broadcast journalism, you said, what if they found out I was scared? What if they found out I was afraid I couldn't do the job, didn't know how to, to do the job? The imposter syndrome was in high gear. But then here's where I think your brilliance comes in. You said, but I knew I had to somehow push past my fears to break through the glass ceiling that I felt existed, even if that meant faking it until I made it. How'd you push through? Well, the incident that you're referring to was actually my leap from my first television station, which was WCIA, where I literally learned everything on the job. Mm. And now I was going to my second television station, which was in Tampa, and I was going to be uh, in a management role, the director of community relations, and I was the only female in upper management. And mm. so I was petrified. I'd only been in the business for three years, and now I'm in this position with all these white men, <laughs> okay, I'm not going to say how old they were, but let's just say a lot of white men, and there's Liz, and it was, I was petrified as I wrote, what if they found out I didn't know how to do the job, I didn't know how to do the job, and so yes, in some respects, I faked it until I made it, but how I pushed through the glass ceiling was through a lot of listening, I did a lot of listening, and then when I was like, you know what, Liz, you've got a good point here. Find the courage to speak up, use that voice. But it was scary. It was very, very scary. And so, you know, I think that's what's hard a lot of times for women in various circumstances where like, I don't know if I should say something. I don't know. Oh, wait, I'm no. Oh, and then some, before you know it, somebody else is saying your idea. It happens all the time. So I had to learn how to listen. Yes, I faked it until I make, made it. But I also, again, comes back to one of the first things we talked about, which is courage. You have to be courageous in life. And that's not always easy because that means you have to change. You have to make changes. You have to make behavioral changes. What's so interesting is a lot of people will come to me and want me to work with them one-on-one. -on -one. Can I just have one session? I'm like, no. No. <laughs> nope. It's a series of sessions together because it's about me holding them accountable, but also them holding themselves accountable and also making behavioral changes, which are very hard to do. And initially they're very, very scary. We don't like change. Oh my right. God, no, you want me to do what? And you talk about that gentleman in your book who um, didn't realize that he was not a great speaker until you video recorded him. And, and you were like, this is why you're not making progress because sometimes people need the visual proof. Look, and the older we get, the harder it is. And there's just, it's just, it's a fact. <laughs> it's just hard to change. And the, the story that you're talking about was a gentleman who was up for a promotion and he thought he was just a great presenter. And, you know, and the video camera is the truth tool. That's why I use it when I'm working with clients, because I could tell them till I'm blue in the face, you need to do this, 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 and this, and here's why, 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 why. And it would be better if you do A, B, C, D, E, F, G. But until they see it and they hear it, does suddenly something go click. Mm -hmm. And that gentleman, you know, I said, well, let's hear your presentation because he had to share his business case. And it was, I did this and then I did that. And then I did this and then I was like, okay, I'm asleep already. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> and once, you know, and I, I point blank asked him, I said, let's take a look at it. And we watched and he said, wow. He goes, that's not very interesting. It's kind of boring, actually. And I said, hmm, interesting. Guess what? You got the content there. We just need to play around with it a little bit. We have to get more creative. Yeah. It's always a story. Everything is a story, a speech, a presentation, a pitch. Everything is a story. It's not fiction. It's fact. But everything is a story. Oh, you talk about in the book, which is tied to imposter syndrome, I think, you talk about this idea of allowing yourself to be authentic and vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And you reference the story, I believe you were in Tampa, and they ask you to sub in 
on a live talk show that also had a call in <laughs> component. So <laughs> manage those two bears at one time. Oh, yeah. And you said, and you and you wrote, I could either walk up there and fake it, or I could come clean with the audience and be my authentic self and vulnerable. And you chose the latter. You said the response from the audience that they were even more behind you because you revealed your humanity to them in that moment. Yes, that that was a very scary day because I had never hosted a live talk show that had an audience, had a, a, a guest, a live guest and, and a call in from the viewers. And it was pretty darn scary. And as I was walking into the studio, I thought, how am I going to do this? I've never done this before. And I remember turning to the audience and just saying, hi, <laughs> I know I'm not, can I'm, not, I'm not the host that you're expecting, Kathy, I'm Liz. And I said, I've never done this before and I'm really, really scared. So I just want your help today. A roar of applause, roar of applause. And it made me feel so good because I did choose to be that raw, to be that authentic, to be that vulnerable. And what's interesting about authenticity and vulnerability is that vulnerability is not wearing your heart on your sleeve for everybody to see. Vulnerability is sharing your stories with the people who have earned the right to hear them. Authenticity, again, not throwing yourself out there and for the whole world to see every emotion you have, no. Authenticity comes down to who are you at your core? What are your values? And when you align with those core values, you never have to question your behavior or your actions. So it's a slight difference but those two things are so important when it comes down to imposter syndrome or outsider syndrome. Man, do we have to hang on to that? And I did that day. And I'm really proud of myself for doing that. I didn't go in there thinking that's what I was going to do. I didn't know what I was going to do, but I'm glad I did. And you also, in, in, in this section of the book, draw a really beautiful distinction between being authentic in, in that vulnerable way that you've just described, but also being stubborn. Mm. and have it <laughs> yeah and I think that's a great we live in a time now where we all talk about my authentic self mm. <laughs> and oftentimes it's I'm just hanging on to the bad habits that I'm comfortable with as opposed right. to really stepping into that place of vulnerability and being present with people exactly a lot of people call that authenticity authenticity because they're afraid to change well I've, I've always done it this way and this is who I am and and I'm not going to change I've had clients tell me that it's like okay Fine. But what's your intention? What's your motivation behind continuing that behavior? Mm -hmm. And how is it helping you or serving you? How is it potentially possibly hindering you from reaching the goals that you just told me you had? Mm -hmm. And new behaviors are hard because it's all unknown. We want to cling to what we know, <laughs> right? It's hard. Which is interesting because in, in a theme that runs through your book, then you start to, you highlight very specific people who are over the age of 50, who mm -hmm. make changes in their lives. And you would, you would think the antithesis, you would think, well, once you're 50, you can't change anything. But I, I, I'm <laughs> totally wrong. <laughs> and I love that you highlight that life doesn't end at 50. That's, that's, that's when some people start doing their most amazing work. And I wonder from, you've worked with so many people now, you've interviewed so many people, mm -hmm. what is it about that 50 year old age, that mark that liberates people? I think no matter what age one is, you need to give yourself permission to assess where am I in my life? Do I, am I living my values, my core values? Am I living my principles of what I believe? Is my life where I want it to be? And if it's not, what do I maybe need to do to make a change? And whether that comes at 20 or 50, it's there. And I think what's been interesting about the pandemic, and I, I have a personal theory, which is that I don't think it's a coincidence that the pandemic happened in the year 2020. Because if you think about the numbers 2020, prior to the pandemic, what did we think about? Go to the ophthalmologist's office. There's the big E on the wall. And I, where's my 20, where's that line where I have 20, 20 vision? 
Well, the pandemic in many respects forced not all of us, perhaps, but most of us to stop and go, whoa, what is going on in my life? Am I where I want to be? Is this the right job for me? Is this the right partner for me? Do I need to renovate my house? Do I need a pet? What do I need to be doing to make sure that I am living my best life? And I think, you know, you talk about the great resignation that has been ongoing because of the pandemic. And while some of it probably is for people who are quote unquote in their 50s, I think it happened across all age ranges. So I don't think that there's an age range. I think it's about giving yourself permission to look at your life and say, am I living my best life? Am I living my core values and my principles and my priorities? Are they in alignment with who I am and who I want to be, who I intend to be in the world? And if they're not, what am I going to do about it? That's the scary part. That's where the permission has to come in. You just mentioned the pandemic and mm -hmm. in your career, in Boston specifically, you sat at the anchor desk mm. for some major world events. 9-11, the Boston, and I, I went on YouTube and watched your coverage of the, the marathon bombing, um, which was spectacular and heartbreaking. Thank you. And I wonder what that meant for you as a journalist to sit at that seat in those life-changing moments for the world. I'll repeat something I said earlier, which is I'm a human being first before I was a reporter, journalist, news anchor. So those stories absolutely profoundly affected me as well as they did the world. 9-11, I ended up being the person who followed the victims' families from day one through 10 years. There was a group of them that were together with me at six months, one year, two years, three years, five years, and then 10 years. And to see the transformation, to have the privilege of witnessing their transformation and, and having them allow me into their lives the way they did, profound experience. When it came to the Boston Marathon bombings, I lived at that time two blocks from the finish line. I could see the finish line. I could see the debris from the bomb explosions. I witnessed the, the inspectors in their sterile white suits walking hand in hand, inch by inch across the Boston Public Library roof, scouring for evidence. I would look at the growing memorial on Copley Square with the sneakers and the candles and the teddy bears. And I mean, just thousands of pieces of, of memorabilia. And I would look at this outside my window and then I'd go to work and I'd talk about it 24 seven. I couldn't escape. And I finally had to force myself. I had to force myself to go over there and allow the emotion because it was so profound and still touches me today. Mm. I remember when that happened and just the way America stopped and yes I think I think a lot of the news got that really right and I think this is you know this is the complication of media today is that in the midst of all of that Rolling Stone put that picture of the bomber on the cover of their magazine that I don't think if I were the editor of that magazine I would have put on the cover of the magazine at that time yeah. because yeah. I think it really disrespected what it's you a lightning did. rod really it's a lightning. lightning rod yeah and i wonder no. what you're i'm sorry go ahead liz no no i just as i'm thinking about this one of the the things that strikes me still to this day is whether it was those stories we just talked about or any of them is that perhaps the best compliment i ever got besides the one that you just gave me a little while ago is that a viewer said to me I know you have to deliver bad news, but somehow coming from you, I feel like everything's going to be okay. And that has always just stuck with me so much because, again, it speaks back to that human connection, that humanity, that being a human being first before anything else. And news is so different today, right? Oh, my gosh. It's just not the same. When I got into the industry, everything was very black and white. Yeah. These were the facts. <laughs> we're going to deliver the facts and you make up your own mind. I think everything's very gray today. 
Mm. And the, the lines between news and entertainment are very, very blurred. And if you think about the television industry as a pie, and when I got into the industry eons ago, we had, you know, four or five slices to the pie. Now there are hundreds of slices to the pie with all these streaming opportunities, all these different channels. I mean, what digital, you know, direct TV, what we have a thousand channels. A thousand. I mean, the, the slices are so much thinner. So everybody's trying to grab that attention wherever yeah. they can to make sure that they get the ratings and they keep getting on the air. So it's very, very different now. I'm glad I'm not in it. I'm just glad I'm not doing news anymore. Don't miss it for a minute. Do you think, and and maybe you answered it, what is your perspective on the democratization of mm -hmm. media? Everyone now is a photojournalist. Everyone now yes. has a platform. And I, you know, I, that happened for that didn't happen in a vacuum. I think many people didn't see themselves reflected in the news at, at certain points. But also the minute we un, un, uncorked that bottle, we also released a lot of complication into the world around news and facts and right. truth there is still truth <laughs> there is still truth no there is still truth and the video camera never lies you know some in some respects so when i got into the industry you know we were just being able to go around the world in an instant with satellites and now you know it, it every second of every day we can go around the world and and so we have all this information coming to us and now everyday citizens yeah get out the iphone here we go you know i'm gonna take a picture i mean and and in many respects i'm glad we have that because it is shedding light on truth in many respects as hard as it is to see sometimes it is shedding light on truth and transparency you have interviewed thousands of people you coached mm -hmm. many many numbers hundreds maybe thousands of people what has it taught you about yourself? Hmm. I think, well, first of all, all of us, almost all of us at one time or another, and in fact, I think research suggests 75% of people feel imposter syndrome at some point in time in their life. So in many respects, that's made me feel like, you know what, Liz, you're just like everybody else. And I've always felt like I was just like everybody else, but it's kind of nice to be validated that Oh, okay. That person who I would never have thought would have had imposter syndrome. And I, I refer to former Navy SEAL Mark Devine in the book. Here's this macho guy, you know, he's number one in his SEAL class and he experienced imposter syndrome. He's an author of best-selling books and he experiences imposter syndrome. Look, it happens to a lot of us. So in many respects, that was validating. But the bigger piece I think is for me, but I think for everybody, we all want to be seen and heard as we intend. We all want to feel appreciated. We all want to feel like we're liked. We all want to feel that we are valuable. And we also all want to feel love. Mm. You know, and in, in all candor, I, I had a little bit of imposter syndrome yesterday as I was writing your questions. I was like, oh my goodness, she's a real journalist. <laughs> And so are you. So are you. Do not negate your your talent here. Brilliant. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. But no, I mean, I'm 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 living through what you're what you're right, talking about is that everyone is subject to it. And I've interviewed so many people now and different yes. levels of success and all of that. And you know, this one mattered to me in a very specific way. I think just because there's so many crossroads where we 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 have met unknowingly um, in our lives. I'm touched I have one, by that. Thank you. <laughs> I have a final question for you. In this season, we're, we're talking about people who have found their voice mm. or who are in search of their voice. And I wonder what you would say you have found or, or have you found your voice and what you would say with your platform and your voice. I believe that I am continually finding my voice. Have I found it more now today than I have a year ago, five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago? Probably yes, and thank goodness for that. <laughs> I'm only getting older. But I also believe that writing my book, Dare to Own You, taking your authenticity and dreams into your next chapter, really had a profound impact on me in helping me continue to find my voice. It was pretty darn scary, Patrick, to share 
some of the stories that I shared, I felt incredibly vulnerable writing them down. But I also felt like I was receiving downloads from the universe. It was divine intervention for me putting those stories in there. And I just had to trust that in some way, shape or form, if I'm able to share my stories, if I'm able to share my voice, if it helps anyone find their voice, then I've done my job. Liz Bruner, thank you so much for your time today and for your wisdom and your heart. Such an important conversation and such important work that you're doing. It's not helping people just grow a business. It's helping people grow into their humanity. That's a gift. And the world needs that. Thank you. My whole vision right now, Patrick, for my life is I want to teach. I want to motivate. And if I can, inspire people to live their best life, whatever that means for them. And so you're doing that. And I thank you for the privilege and the honor of being able to have this conversation with you today. Thank you very, very much. I appreciate it. Thank you, too. Thank you, too, Liz. And to those of you who are watching or listening, remember, we all have a voice. Use yours wisely. Bye, everyone. Thank you, Liz. Mm-hmm.